when I first started production music, it was daunting. I mean, what's velocity? You know, what's expression? What's dynamics? What is, um, you know, sustain? And all these different kinds of, all of these things that, that, that go on with and through there. You know, I just want to be able to hit the center of the club face, or I just want to be able to hit the ball with the club, you right. know? And you're wanting me to do all this other stuff over yep. here, you know? Yeah. So abs- absolutely, absolutely, you know, take the time to learn what you have, and then you can invest into more expensive stuff. What is happening, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the 52 Q's podcast, your weekly dose of all things production and library music. Whether you're simply curious about the sync industry or wanting to write better cues, or maybe you're ready to pitch to publishers, I promise you, you are in the right place. My name is Dave Croft, and it is so good to be with you today. And if you find this video helpful, then uh, why don't you give it a thumbs up here on YouTube or a five-star review in your podcast app. And please be sure to subscribe because I post content about library music every single week. Today's episode wouldn't be possible without the incredible support of our member subscribers at 52Qs, who not only keep the community alive and thriving, but as members, they get access to extra features like workshops, live streams, office hours, queue breakdowns, Zoom feedback sessions, hundreds of hours of video archives, and opportunities to submit to Real Music Library. So if you're ready to get started and make that serious push into a career in production music, then why don't you head over to 52Qs.com. It's free to join and memberships start at around four bucks a month. So it is week four, 2024. I hope that you are having a really good week so far. And uh, how did my week go? Well, I, I'm gonna tell a little story. You know, I drink coffee all the time. And as I was coming up to to film this uh, podcast intro here, I was running up the stairs and my coffee started sloshing around. And my immediate my immediate reaction was to compensate. Oh, it's sloshing this way, so I'm going to slosh that way. Oh, it's sloshing this way, so I'm going to slosh that way. I was just going up the stairs too fast. And no amount of compensating for the sloshing coffee in my mug would keep it from spilling. In fact, I felt like every time I tried to compensate, I made things worse. The coffee inside just sloshed around even more. And it wasn't until I stopped. It wasn't until I stopped walking up the stairs, I tropped, stopped trying to compensate, I just let things settle that the coffee settled down and I was able to walk up the stairs without spilling it over everything and not make a complete mess of things. And uh, I, think, uh, I think that's a really, good, it's a really good metaphor to keep in mind. If, if you are going, 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 and you feel like, oh, I'm overcorrecting and it's not going well and things are kind of going out of control. Instead of trying to fix them, sometimes the best thing you can do is just breathe, take, take a breath, pause, let things settle down. Let, let, the, let the, the, the coffee in the mug of your life settle down and then you can start again. And so that was just a reminder of, of what I need to, to do especially this week, especially wrapping up an album, we're going to take a listen to one of my Expedition 52 cues, which is called Cora the Explorer. <laughs> and um, But I'm wrapping up this album. I've got a lot of other albums kind of on deck that I need to get get going. And part of me wants to like, go, 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 get going, get going. But if I just pause, relax, take a big breath, then I'm able to move forward and not have things feeling like they're teetering out of control. I don't know. Like I said, this just kind of hit me as I was coming up, uh, up, up to record here, and that's how it's going. I'm purposefully relaxing. Relaxing. Which brings me to my cue for this week. Uh, this was my week four submission for Expedition 52. And if you're watching this, Expedition 52, we've gone up the mountain. We are not taking any more climbers for the expedition. If there is enough interest, we might start an expedition in July to have a mid-year expedition. But right now, we've got, I think, 49 folks in the group, and we are riding every single week. And so if you would like to sign up, 
for the mailing list and, and um, get notified when the next expedition uh, leaves up the mountain, then head over to expedition52.com and you can check that out. So, so like I said, uh, the, the cue that I want to uh, show for you today is called Cora the Explorer, uh, and Cora is an African stringed instrument. And uh, obviously the, the pun is uh, Dora the Explorer. Uh, and so it features Cora and uh, other authentic uh, African uh, instrument, uh, African percussion instruments. I created some shakers and we have some marimba and kalimba and ngoni, which is kind of like a banjo sounding guitar uh, type of instrument. But uh, let's take a listen to uh, Cora the Explorer. So that was Cora the Explorer, and uh, if you want to see a breakdown of that, uh, I will be putting that up for the family and friends, subscribers over at 52 Qs, a complete Q breakdown, including the sounds I used and the compositional process that went through all of that. I am so happy to welcome to the podcast Mr. Shane Jensen, who is not only a longtime supporter of 52 Qs. I've had the, honestly, the privilege of working with him for, for wow, going on, going on two years now, I think. I think two it's years. been, and uh, through coaching and, uh, and mentoring. And uh, Shane just isn't, you know, you're just a, a person who, who showed up one day wanting to learn production music. He is an accomplished music director. He is a lifelong musician and in a former life, was a professional golfer. And so I wanted to bring Shane on to the podcast today to talk about how these other professional aspects dovetail into the world of production music and specifically being a professional athlete, specifically being a professional golfer. But Shane, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the 52 Qs podcast. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for having me so much. I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. Yeah, and I always look forward to our discussions. I've lost track the number of times that a coaching session has kind of turned into, you know, just either talking life or talking like conceptual things. We'll, yeah, we have cues. We'll, we'll get to the cues in a minute, but talking about career and creativity. And I love the fact that you are always thinking. You are, you're challenging. Uh, and what I mean by that is you're challenging me. You're not just taking, here, do this at face value because I'm Dave and Dave says to do it. But you're always questioning. You're always pushing back. And this this feels super, like, I don't mean this. It's, it's, it's really rewarding uh, for me as a, as, a teach, as a teacher and a coach and a mentor because it tells me that you're not just 
taking things at kind of face value on a surface level, but you're really absorbing them. You're processing them. And uh, there are things that, that you've, that you've brought and I've I'm like, I disagree. And you're like, well, that's okay because I believe in this. Is that, that idea of kind of being a lifelong learner and kind of questioning, has that always been just part of who you were? Uh, Dave, I think, I think so. Um, you know, I started, you know, piano lessons when I was probably seven years old mm. and it coincided with when I actually started golf as well. And so I have always had this, this thirst for knowledge and I've always tried to do as much reading as I can and improving. And I think as I've gotten older, I realized that, you know, learning is a lifelong process mm. that it just never ends. You know, you may achieve accolades or whatever it is, you know, maybe these pinnacles that we put ourselves upon, but really there's so much to learn, especially in music and golf, the depth of the knowledge is so deep. I mean, that there's no way to encompass all of it within one lifetime. Yeah. And so yeah. I think that's what spurs me forward. And, and, and I got to tell you, that is, for me being a teacher, that is teacher fuel. Like you, if I have a student who I know is just absorbing everything and like more, just give me more, just give me more. You're like, you're at a buffet, you know, and you got your plate super piled high and you're like, I got room over here for more. And for me as a teacher... I, I can't describe how rewarding that is. So I just thank you, man. Thank you for all of all of your your support and for being such uh, a, a, a willing participant and uh, an open vessel, if you will. If that's not too weird or whatever. But. Absolutely, and I, and I think that I think that that I think that one of the reasons why we kind of gelled is because I view you have the heart of a teacher. Mm. And so, you know, I, I've, I've always said, no matter whether it's music or golf, that you have to find someone who has achieved at a high level. They may not be achieving now at a high level, but has achieved at some point in their life at a high level and cleave upon to them to, to you know, absorb the knowledge that they actually have. And you are such an individual. Now, you're at the, the height of your game, and I'm sure that you will probably go higher, but uh, I, I can't underestimate the, the value that you have added to my journey in the production music space. Well, thank you so much. That, I really really, really appreciate the kind words. And anytime I see like a coaching session pop up, I'm like, all right, this is, and we always go long, you know, and it, it's just really super rewarding. So I just wanted to start out by just acknowledging that and just, and just thank you. And again, the, one of the big reasons I wanted to have you on is that you've achieved success as a musician, as a music director, you know, you've, you've got uh, published uh, arrangements, you know, that, that somebody could right now go and buy. You're, you're an accomplished pianist, you're a theater musician, you're a music director at your church. But even before all of that, like I said in the intro, in, the, in a former life, you were a professional golfer. And I know you still play, but how much do, do you play these days? Well, I play, I try to play two times a week, but this last time, this last week, I actually got to play three times this last week because of the holiday. And so um, I, I definitely try to play two times a week at minimum. Now, at, at, at the height of you being a professional golfer, how, how, much, how much were you playing? Um, I was probably playing, you know, when I was growing up, I would play every day in the summers. I'd probably play 36 holes in the, in the, in the course of a day. I was probably playing between 300 to 310 times a year. Um, so, and out on the golf course and practicing and stuff like that. So it is, a, it, it was a, a big part of my life for a long time. Wow. Now what, what got you into being a, a golfer and, and how did you achieve like professional success. Like I, I know the path in, in music, but I would, how, how do you even get started at that? So I was, I was fortunate enough that, um, my, my family was, was members of a couple country clubs and we were growing up in Denver. And so that was my first introduction to that. And it happened when I was about seven years old and you, you know, golf is one of those sports that it takes a long time to really master. I was fortunate to be able to take lessons and group lessons and, and, and be a part of that. And so I was able to accelerate my growth a little bit more, um, by taking those lessons. And as a junior, I had some success. I won the club championship, the junior club championship at our, uh, home club course. And then I, uh, went on and played in, uh, some professional tournaments, you know, when I, when I got a little bit older and finally I decided, you know, golf is one of those games, um, where you've got to be really, really good to play like Tiger Woods mm. and Rory McIlroy. I mean, those guys are just 
so far out of. And so I, I decided it's kind of like Tiger Woods and Rory Macro is like what we might term the film composers. And then I moved over into the, 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 uh, club running and the uh, managing golf courses and stuff like that area, which would more be more like the production mm. music side. So one part of the whole different kind of thing. And so um, I did that, uh, moved down to South Florida, worked for a number of years down in South Florida, you know, still was playing and everything like that and went through there. The PJ has an extensive uh, training program that we go through where you're talking about golf cart maintenance and, and uh, food and beverage and all these different kinds of things while trying to still keep your game uh active so um that's how that's how i got was when i was young my parents really instilled into me that my, my parents never forced me to do anything like my brother you know um really can't hit a golf ball you know but he he had the same opportunities that i did he just chose to go a different direction he had the long hair and listened to metallica and played uh, yeah i feel know. like me and your brother would get along because i i am not a fan of golf I've I've tried it. Now, disc golf or frisbee golf or frolf, and I know ball golfers have a thing against like, it's like disc golfers even profaning the word golf, but um, I, I'm really terrible at it. And as, as anybody who's known me for long knows, I do not like doing things I'm really bad at. That's why I play games on easy mode. We've talked about that on the podcast, but I've not had any luck as a golfer um, because it, it didn't come naturally to me. I was really terrible at it. But a as I'm thinking about it and, and having talked to you, knowing how much golf you played, knowing about the amount of time you put in from a very young age, there is a ton of overlap. There, uh, let me say it a different way. There are a ton of parallels between pursuing golf, either professionally or as a hobby or even just, you know, as a, as a pro-am or whatever. There's a ton of parallels between golf and production music. And, and, uh, we, when we were talking before we started, we unpacked like five areas that golf can help you or the parallels between golf and production music specifically. So the first thing, and I'm, I'm going to hand it over to you. The first is the toolbox, the tools you use. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, uh, you know, much like in, in production music, golf equipment is extremely expensive. And I know that you did that podcast about that Spitfire mm -hmm. violins, <laughs> which are like 400 some odd dollars. But in, in the golf space, you could buy one club for like $700. And that's just like a driver. And, and they're constantly changing this technology. But what I have found is, is that, um, you know, you have 14 clubs in your bag and all of them serve a different purpose, but all of them can be used in a variety of different ways. Mm. And so you have to learn how to use each one of the club, whether it be like swinging, you know, with less wrist or with more wrist. And so I would equate this to a sound library where you're using the mod wheel and you're using the CC, you know, one or the CC 11 in order to get the most out of what you have uh, already that's in your bag. You know, often there's this thing that, oh, I've, I've got to go out and get this, this new club because it's really going to improve my game. But what we have found in the golf space is that over the last 20, 25 years, with all of this advancement in technology, the average golf handicap has not gone down. It's re stayed relatively the same. Okay. So I'm sorry. I'm going to put a pit. I want to pause. What is a golf handicap? I, admittedly, I have no idea what that means. So in order to be fair uh, on a golf course, you, you, we get a handicap and that's, it, it's in, in the, the simplest of terms, it's, it's not really, but it's a, it would be an average of the scores that you shoot. So let's say that you shoot a, uh, an 80, uh, you average about an 80, your handicap is probably going to be around a six or a seven. The, the higher your number, if you shoot a 90, it's probably going to be around, you know, an 18 to a 20, which is about the average golf handicap between 18 to 20. And it's used in. to offset or basically um, kind of equalize scores. equalize the playing field. So someone who has doesn't have the experience that I have, it would be very difficult to beat me. Now I'm all for that because that helps pay a mortgage or something like that from the the bets that we do on the golf course. <laughs> right. But a lot of people don't like just to donate money to the Shane Jensen Mortgage Fund. So. Um, so that's why we have that's why we have handicaps is is to kind of equal or level the playing field, you know. And and they have this in tennis, you know. There there's there's different levels of tennis players like three point whatever, and then, so they have they have this in tennis as well. So it's not unusual in 
um, physical sports to have a handicap. Gotcha. Got it. They're just kind of some gimme points because you are not as good as I am. And otherwise, it you would don't just want be... to spend the time practicing to become as good as I right, am. Right. Right. The 10,000 yeah. hours it, it takes. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. All right. I appreciate that. I, I didn't mean to yeah, yeah. totally interrupt, but no. I imagine I'm going to get some uh, golf terms. Uh, but today I learned yeah. what, what a handicap yeah. was. So, so the standard, the standard way that people do things now is say, oh, I'm going to go buy this new driver and it's going to, you know, cut me, it's going to cut my handicap by 12 or 13 strokes. And I'm just going to play really good. And that's really not the case. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and very, and th- we've seen that through the handicaps, not really moving the average handicap, not really moving over the last, all of these decades of, of, of game improvement that we had over there. And so, I can play, because I have a firm foundation, I can play a club that I played 25 years ago and still beat the guys who are playing the new mm. um, new clubs that they're doing right now. The, the so $700 the, clubs. Yes, the $700 clubs. So the takeaway is, is that you really have to learn how to use the clubs that you have in a, confici- uh, in, in a proficient manner. And then maybe you might go buy some kind of uh, technology that's going to help you maybe just further that down the road, but it, it can't be the starting point. So, uh, you know, when I was, when I was first starting out in production music, you know, of course I all want to have the Berlins and the orchestral tools mm-hmm. and all these different kinds of things. But, you know, f- for me, it just didn't really add up because I wasn't proficient in some of the other things that could improve this quality of the sound, uh, that I had. So I equated, you know, uh, you know, now, now that Black Friday is passed, we all have these things that we want to buy, these new clubs and, and these new sound libraries. But for it, it takes a lot of restraint to say, okay, I need to work on some fundamentals first. And yeah, then yeah. I but have. I'd imagine, you know, the marketing pushes in pretty hard. You know, as we're recording this, like Black Friday just, just happened and the blitz, the all out marketing blitz. And I admit, I was like, oh, drawn in the whole FOMO. And I feel like, ooh. If I get just, if I finally pull the trigger on Diva, then this will happen. That happens just as much in in the golf industry, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you see, you see a, a, a television advertisement with Tiger Woods or Rory McIlroy or John Rahm or Dustin Johnson, and they're blasting it out there 320 yards. And you're thinking to myself, oh my gosh, if I only had that club, I could hit it 320 <laughs> yards. Because it, it's and, the club, not, not the, yes. the 80 hours a week on the course. Absolutely. That's, that's, that's the marketing. And that is, you know, that's, that's what makes golf such a, uh, you know, the marketing is just, you know, you get these players who achieve at a high level and, and, and people think that they're going to, they're going to have the same results. They should, but a disclaimer results, not typically right. <laughs> like know. a weight loss supplement. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. No, exactly. Uh, yeah. I, I don't, I don't disagree with that. I think there are a lot of industries which kind of over promise and under deliver, but that's for another, that's for another topic. So uh, you don't need every new fancy tool. You don't need every new club. You don't need every library and knowing the tools that you do have. Right. So e- now do you need, like when I was younger, my dad had a set of clubs and they were old. They were like really old and, and um, some of them were bent and, and all of that. And we just had a handful, like there were maybe a couple of irons, a couple of woods. Does it sound like I know what I'm talking about? I barely know what I'm talking And then there was a, uh, a wedge and a putter. And so we basically used like the wood to tee off, the iron to do mid game and the putter, right? But we didn't like have like all of the different vari- variants of each one of those because like you said, you can do multiple things with the same club. And is that part of just the technique or just overcoming the, uh, the disadvantage that, that uh, an improper club, is this making any sense? Yeah. Well, I, I will say I have 14 clubs in my bag. That's the maximum allowed by the USGA. And of those 14 clubs, I may only use eight in the course of a round. So there's some clubs that I'm not really using, but I but I need to have them because I may use a different set of clubs for the next eight rounds. So mm. 14 is your starting base of where you where you realistically should be, and so then you, you then you say oh, okay, well I need to hit this lower or I need to hit this higher or I need to have more spin or I need to have less spin, and and so using using the clubs in order to produce different shots. Um, really becomes uh, paramount to be able to score well. Right. So knowing how to use your your toolbox really enhances your ability to be able to score well. But even even like what you're talking about, for me, 
like you're talking about spin and stuff. I'm like, I don't know. I just want to hit it in a straight line, right? I just want to not go in the trees. That's where my skill set is. And so maybe if you're thinking about a, a new sample library, you know, it's like, you know what? I, I'm still working on like luffs and loudness and, and I'm balancing like how to spell chords. I don't need to get into the weeds. Hey, see, get into the weeds uh, with all of this uh, other things that just don't apply to me yet. Absolutely. Uh, that, that, that's, that's absolutely correct. I mean, it, when I first started production music, it was daunting. I mean, what's velocity, you know, what's expression, what's dynamics, what is, um, you know, sustain and all these different kinds of all of these things that, that, that go on within through there, you know, I just want to be able to hit the center of the club face, or I just want to be able to hit the ball with the club, <laughs> right, you know, exactly. and you're wanting me to do all this other stuff over yep. here, you know? Yeah. So abs absolutely, absolutely. You know, take the time to learn what you have and then you can invest in. Okay. So, so that stuff. is a uh, point one, the toolbox yes. using mm -hmm. the tools. Uh, part number two or the second way that, that golf, what we can learn from golf and apply it to production music is having a strong foundation. Talk about that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, you know, I don't play and practice as much as I, as, as I did when I was much younger, uh, you know, uh, as, as we get older physically, we, we, we tend to not to be able to do, and you have work and, you know, family obligations and stuff like that. And so it becomes very difficult to get out and play and practice as much as you would like to. But I, uh, because of the training that I went through when I was in the early stages of my golfing career, has now because you, you you have an understanding of of you know it's kind of like you know reading a book on nutrition you once you have the foundation then you can build something after mm -hmm. that and you'll always have that information with you and so because i did i put in the hard work when i was younger i built that foundation spent the hours on there that has now benefited me where my handicap right now is around a three or a four, which is really, really very good for, you know, the casual weekend duffer. Um, so this foundation has now enabled me to like mid round, if something's going awry, now I can say, okay, what is a past experience I have had that I can call upon to be able to correct the ship and write the ship so I don't shoot 90 or 95. And so this foundation uh, really helps me to be able to you know, bring my scores down. And in production music, it's the same way. You know, the grounding of the grounding of my, my musical experience prior to that um, really helped to set a foundation where there was things that I still had to learn, but I knew some of the basics about how to write a piece of music or something like that. So there was some crossover. And so I might not have to, to, to you know, I, I know how to read music. So I would, I don't have to necessarily work on some of the other things. That, right. It's you know, like so that in golf, learning a specific course, right. Or a, a certain, you know, ha and we'll talk about hazards and stuff here in a second, but learning the layout of a certain course, you're not you're not still learning how to swing the club. That is going to apply no matter where you no matter where you play or what type of game you're trying to play, right? There's a short game, the long game, but swinging, swinging the club, form, you know, stance, you know, how you grip, those are universal regardless of what kind of club you're holding, what uh what the conditions are, you know, um, yes. those foundational kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing that changes slightly is the grass type that you are playing on, whether it be Bermuda or whether it be rye grass or whether it be, um, bent grass, you know, so there, there's some considerations there, but as far as how I grip the club, how I stand, how my posture is, that's all the same mm. through that. And that makes a big difference in any, um, variance from those, uh, standard positions creates havoc with inside and it can only be like an inch or so. I mean, that's one of, that's what makes golf so difficult is that just an inch variance of something you did before can totally, uh, you know, destroy the game. Yeah. And, and that only comes through doing the reps, spending the, the, spending the time with the club swinging and hitting a ball, right? It's not going to happen. I mean, you can read about it. You can watch videos about it all day long. You can take courses, you can watch podcasts, but at the end of the day, You've got to you've got to put a club in your hands and start swinging at a ball. Yeah, and that foundation 
just uh, some context, that foundation is not built in a six month period of time. Mm. For golf, that foundation is built over five, six years where you, where you, where you're pounding out the reps and stuff like that. So uh, much like production music, it is not a, it is not an accelerated growth. I mean, you see, I mean, you, you see it in any field, you see these, these uh, young people who are phenoms and stuff like that. But what you don't see is the eight hours a day that they spent from the time that they were four to the time that they were eight or nine or 10, that they were out there honing their craft. Right. I mean, Mozart was the same way. I mean, we just seem to think that Mozart just wrote, spewed out these things, but we don't see what his father did for him, <laughs> you know, and, and the hours that he spent doing that yeah. as a young child. Yeah. You m- 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 most of which involuntarily. <laughs> yes, absolutely. No, absolutely. So, so what would be your encouragement to somebody maybe on the early side? Because, because you, you've had a successful golfing career, you've had a successful performing career, music director career, and now you're working towards a successful production music career. What would be your encouragement to somebody who's maybe on the front nine, uh uh-huh, see all these golfing metaphors, on the front nine of their career and maybe feeling a little discouraged? So I would say, one of the the things that I would say is... um, don't when you're when you're first starting out in golf don't be results oriented mm. be technique oriented and i say this because you know when i when I, I i taught i've taught thousands of golf lessons for a wide variety of different ability levels and one thing that i always saw was that with, with to to almost a person that you actually got worse when you first started taking lessons than when you know um than when you previously were. And the reason for that is because you're trying to make changes to bad habits. You know, initially when you stop deciding you're going to eat sugar, you may feel really bad and say, no, I've got to have the sugar because it's got to get there. But the the reality of it is, is that in the long term, that's going to be the same. That's going to be beneficial. So the same thing in golf and in music, work on the fundamentals and it may take a little while to get those fundamentals, but that's really going to help you in the long run, short-term pain for long-term gain. Yeah, which which brings me to the next point, which kind of dovetails into this, which is enjoying that that process and enjoying those those small victories, like the the the, the where you can find a win, celebrate celebrate those. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I I remember. Um, and th- and this is so important because sometimes in, in the golf space, we get so bogged down with performance because because look at it realistically. You know, if I don't shoot seventy one or seventy or sixty seven or sixty eight, I'm not going to be able to feed my family. You know, at that point, and so there's some serious pressure that's coming on to you, and so. I remember 1994. I was playing in the Colorado Open in Colorado, which at that time, you know, this is, you know, what 30 years ago. <laughs> um, this was a big tournament. You know, this was a big. It was a state open, and state opens were big tournaments. I think Phil Nicholson was playing in the field at oh, the wow. time, and so uh, I qualified for. You had to qualify for it. I qualified for it, and it was the first golf tournament I ever made a, a cut in. My first professional golf tournament that I ever made the cut in, and this thing will always stand with me no matter what. This is one of the small successes. So I am on the 18th, 18th green, and I hit my tee shot pretty good. I hit my second shot to the right of the green and there's a small crowd assembled around the 18th green and i uh, so i miss the green it's a par four and so i get up for my next shot and i end up holding the shot out and these people around the green are just clapping and applauding and just and, you know the feeling that that gives you to have people there recognizing your achievements and it's 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 relatively small i mean you see people chip in all the time but that small success you know that i ended up making the cut in the tournament and ended up doing fairly well and so it was a very exciting thing small win but it has a big impact on how you move forward mentally yeah and, and the small win might be uh, hey i hit the ball straight <laughs> Absolutely. Or, or hey, I, I I shaved off one stroke on my game. Now it might be a giant number because if you don't follow golf, the lower the score is, the better, right? Uh, but that that's that's kind of what we're talking about here. Now, now, what are some small victories that you've experienced in the production music world? 
I am always thrilled. You know, I, I've had some, uh, I have a couple tracks with, uh, you know, Rob, one of your uh, publishers over there, which is, which is a, a, a complete, really exciting. But I, you know, some, some small wins I have, I've uploaded some music to Pond5. I've uploaded some music to Sheet Music Plus and stuff like that. And every time I get an email that says, hey, you sold, like I, I just uploaded a, a piece of music called Hyper Minuet and G, which was kind of a, a hip hoppy of Minuet and G by Bach yeah. up to Pond5. And I got a, I got a notification the other day that that actually sold. Now that sold for, I got, my portion was 70 cents, but that is just huge. That is just huge in, you know, it's like, wow, I've got to do more. I get 70 cents. I could sell a million of those. And, you know, I mean, it's just like, you know, so, so these small successes, no matter what they are, it's just, and it's, it's tangible, you know, it, 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 it's immediate and it's, it's right there. And so much like in golf production music, that that's, and it's, it's it. additive, like small victories yes. build towards large victories. And so before you know it, you look back and, and yeah, I sold uh, a year ago, I sold one Q for 70 cents, but then, okay, now I have 20 Qs and this Q yeah. got placed and this Q got placed and I finished three albums. And uh, when, you, when you stay focused on the small victories, first of all, it doesn't seem insurmountable. Like if I said, hey, you are going to be a professional golfer and it's going to take, you know, X number of hours and X number of years and X number of dollars. Uh, and so just write me a check right now at the start and uh, I'll see you in 10 years. That would be way, yeah, that would be super overwhelming. And if I said, hey, uh, if, if I went two years ago and said, hey, Shane, two years from now, you know, you will have spent this much money on coaching services and you will have gotten this number of placements and you're going to have to write this number of cues with this number of hours of feedback and everything. You would have probably walked away because it just feels ins insurmountable. Um, but chipping away uh, at these at, at and finding the small victories and using them as handholds while you are scaling the mountain of the thing that you're trying to do, whether it's golf, I don't know, whether it's weight loss or whether it's uh production music right yeah yeah and, and and getting those small successes um you know we we all want to you know when you, you know we all want to you know have that easy one shot pill but it's most satisfying the journey that you go on and develop those skills and able to reproduce that and be able yeah. to you know see those time and time again. Yeah. I think some folks approach production music and and, and they're like, you know what, I'm gonna it, it would be like stepping up to the T and expecting a hole in one every single time. It's just nearly statistically impossible. Even the best golfers on the planet who ever lived, Tiger Woods never hold in one every single shot uh, every time he stepped up to the tee box. Nope. And so if, if you're starting production music, you're early in your career, or maybe you're, you're further down the road, you know, and you think, oh, this didn't get placed or this didn't find a home or this didn't make air. That that's like expecting to hit a hole in one every time or whatever sports metaphor, you know, uh, it's like, uh, hitting a home run every time you, you go up to bat, it's, it's just not going to happen. And if you expect that, if you expect these giant victories, every time you, you step up to the ball, you're just going to be disappointed, man. Yeah. Well, how many times did we have, you know, uh, heated conversations. You know, I, I'm coming to the perspective, I've got a master's in music. I know what I'm talking about here. What do you mean I have to do this over here? And it, it's exactly the same thing. It's, it's like having this expert knowledge in one area and then trying to translate that into another area. You just kind of pound your head. You say, you know, why, why is this not working? Yeah. You know, what, what's going on here? I mean, I mean, even Michael Jordan didn't cut it <laughs> as a b baseball player. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> he tried. He he. Uh, arguably, he's on the Mount Rushmore of basketball um, Hall of Fame. Right there are four basketball players. He'd be one of those faces, um, but he had a mediocre <laughs> baseball career because you're not starting with this. You're not starting at our ten thousand. You know, you're starting at maybe our two thousand. So yeah, enjoying those right. small victories, but Absolutely. along the way. As we are pursuing the thing and we're, we're enjoying, hey, I hit the ball straight, you are going to run into hazards. You're going to, to get roadblocks. You're going to put the ball in the water. You're going to go into the sand. You're going to go into the rough. You're going to pitch some music that just doesn't land and goes nowhere. Um, so let's talk about that and, and what we can do and what we can learn from golf in avoiding the hazards. 
Right. And, and, you know, golf courses are full of hazards. Now they vary by geography region down in South Florida, where you're at, they have a lot of sand, they have alligators, they have <laughs> Like that's uh, a real water. thing. <laughs> yeah, real thing. They have sticky grass. That's really that, you know, here in, in, in Las Vegas, we have uh, desert areas, you know, sparseness of trees. We have really fast, you know, fairways and stuff like that. In Colorado, where I grew up, you have giant, you know, pine trees and stuff like that. And so, Avoiding the hazards are really going to make sure that your score is um, is better. And but knowing how to play out of those mm-hmm. hazards, there's a different technique to know how to play out of the sand than there is to how to play out of the the middle of the fairway from the grass, or how to play out of the rough when your ball is sitting down. You know how how is the club going to react with the ball? If I get grass caught between the ball and the club, it's going to affect the spin that's on the golf ball. So I need to factor that into what I'm actually uh, what I'm actually doing. And that's when you're bringing and, so, and that's when you're bringing some of the specialized tools that you don't always use. Right? You might you don't yeah. need a wedge every single time. Only if you're in the sand, or only if you're stuck somewhere and need to uh, right. Navigate. It's a shorter distance, and 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 I might you know use more wrist, and, and the technique of the stroke actually changes depending on if I want to hit it high, or if I want to hit it low, or if I want to, you know, any number of different things with the ball position as well, and and so avoiding these hazards, but also knowing how mm-hmm. to play out of these hazards really becomes extremely important yeah, it, to being successful at golf. It, and, is it is it fair to say that you will hit hazards like? Oh, I, I mean, uh, Tiger Woods has, has gone into the bunker. Tiger Woods has put balls in the water, right? Uh, avoiding the hazards, and I th- I've used this analogy before. Like it's like getting into a boxing ring and expecting not to get hit. The goal isn't to not get hit; it is to take the hit and and stay focused and still stay on 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 your plan. There are times when I fell, I've hit every hazard on the entire golf course as I'm moving around it. And so, you know, it's not if you're going to hit hazards, it's when you're going to hit a hazard and how are you going to get out of that hazard or how can I avoid that hazard? Maybe I just have to aim left of the hazard, you know, so, I, so I'm not hitting it into the hazard. But doesn't that for off- me? I'm sorry, doesn't that often come from you hit the hazard and then the next time you play, you're like, okay, I'm not going to do that again and I'm going to learn from having hit the hazard before. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Especially if you play the same golf course all the time. Then yeah. you can say, okay, I don't want to hit it over here. That's right. I, I, there's one hole at the golf course I play all the time out in Boulder City. And and and, and I hate this golf <laughs> hole. I just hate this golf hole because I always pull it left and that's automatic desert because everything slopes to the left. Mm. And if you go left, you know, but you don't have much room to the right because everything at a certain point slopes to the right. And so it's really just a difficult hole. And so I just get up on that hole and say, okay, I'm just going to write down a double bogey on my card. You know, because that's just that's just the way it's going to be on this whole. So um, it's sometimes like, there's just self acceptance. Yeah, it's like you know, me not accepting. doing vocal track. There's my double bogey. Like no, nope, right? Yeah, I'm not exactly. Gonna sing on a track unless it's like like tongue in cheek dramedy cue. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. And so, and so during our interactions in, in the early going stages, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, I had a lot of hazards that I didn't know about in my production music, uh, you know, uh, uh, stinger button endings, you know, not modulating keys, you know, uh, making sure it's all one tempo uh, going through and form. I mean, we, we had some, we had some really <laughs> choice uh, conversations about the form of, of an actual song. And then I think, I think one of the biggest things that we, we really had to hammer into me you did uh was was melody Mm. and what constituted a melody and so these are all the hazards that i had to navigate in order to produce something was going to be production music worthy yeah and and the hazards in that that type of cue was because of the type of course you were playing on right you just mentioned you know in florida you have these conditions and in nevada you have these conditions it's not necessarily yes it's the same game but it's not the same course, not the same layout. And you're going to be using different tools and different techniques. And so, you know, uh, you're, you're going to have to learn about form and structure. And some, in some level, you're kind of unlearning what you've already learned, right? The, the 10,000 hours Absolutely. you put in as a music director, as a composer and a theater musician and, and all of that. It's not that it's for nothing, but you have to kind of translate and you have to realize, okay, I'm about to tee off and I know this slopes to the left. So I'm going to have to counter that, but you only learn that by playing the hole to begin with. Like I can sit here and tell you, okay, Shane, hole number eight, it's going to slope to the left. You're going to have to pull it to the right. 
And until you do that and you feel what pulling to the right feels like, no amount of me telling you about it, no amount, you just have to walk through it. And I think that that can be super challenging because, you know, most humans are pain averse. Yes, the boxer doesn't like getting hit, but they're going to get hit. And it's how you, how you work through it. But, um, Absolutely. you know, I just talked about how I don't like playing games that are, that are hard, right? Because I, I'm not instantly good at them. And so uh, it has to be rewarding enough, like golf, no offense, golf is not rewarding enough for me to push through that pain, but I will sit here and uh, like tweak synths all day long, or I will like try rollerblading or cycling and falling down over and over and over, not cycling on my rollerblades, um, because I I really, really enjoy it. But um, you can't avoid those hazards altogether. We can mitigate them. But at the end of the day, failure, I'm sorry to say, failure is often the best teacher. Absolutely. I, I couldn't wholeheartedly agree with you more, you know, because you're not going to play your best every single day, nope. especially on the golf course. I mean, there was a period of time where I was shooting 90, 91, just three or four years ago. And so you have to go back and reevaluate what it is that you're doing. And those self-reflective times are really, really important, you know, yeah. and that's where your foundation comes in because then you can actually... Um, look at what you're doing from a cogent, uh, you know, aspect. Like if I didn't know anything about golf, it'd be very difficult for me to pull myself out of the slump. But because I had that foundations, I was able to pull myself out of that, uh, that slump. And, and I think and, the same thing in production music. And sometimes the hazards are completely out of your control. Like you might be on a course and yes, you know, the late you've played the course, you know, it's going to pull to the left and you, you compensate, but a wind gust happens that's completely out of your control that is going to knock your ball off off course, right? It's going to knock it off of its trajectory. Uh, What would be your encouragement to folks who might be feeling like that? Like, hey, Dave, I'm I'm doing everything you're saying, right? I'm a taxi subscriber or or, uh, I'm I'm following your podcast. And and any encouragement from the golf golf world uh, about navigating those when you feel like, well, I mean, not to put too fine a point on it, but feel like giving up. Yeah, I mean, and there, there have there have been periods of time when I when I have felt like I wanted to give up. And um, one of the things about golf is that no matter how bad that I actually play, I just actually, I actually love, I I, I love the game, and so I love exploring the game. I love doing, and, and I, and I played some, and there was a period of time in my life where I took off about three or four years where I actually didn't play hardly any golf because it was just, you know, it, it was just extremely frustrating. But then I went back, I, I reevaluated and I went back to it. But my, my encouragement would be to just keep plowing forward because in golf, you never know what is going to trigger good play again mm. because it's 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 a game of inches i mean i could move my ball position you know two or three inches forward in my stance and that's going to make all the difference in the world so you can't you can't just stop doing what you're doing expecting it to get any better you've got to just keep tinkering and yeah. fidgeting and 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 learning as much as you can because there's always something to learn i mean i find myself going back to golf books you know even now at my at my age and my ability level just to just to refresh and so keep tinkering you know not everyone's going to like what you do and that's the great thing about golf is that not every golf swing looks the same yeah. but they they produce some really great results yeah at the end over here. at the end of the day everybody's getting their ball in the hole i mean that's that's the goal but i i'll i'll add on to that you have to enjoy the smell of the grass you have to enjoy that that the morning feel you have to enjoy swinging a club you have to enjoy wearing, you know, a collared shirt, right? Right. You yeah, have yeah. to enjoy everything about it. Just like you have to enjoy the writing process. Yes. In, in fact, I, I would say you probably need to enjoy it more. You need to enjoy writing more than having written. You need to enjoy golf and playing golf more than the score at the end of the day. That's not really why you play. I mean, yes, you want, you want to get placements and you want to have lower scores, blah, blah, but... It's the entire experience that is is the reward, not just how 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 quickly did you get the ball in the hole. Yeah, 
And and that's and, and and golf is volatile. Like I think this week, I think I shot a, a seventy six at one, and then and then I went up and shot an eighty one, and then an eighty. But it's that seventy six that keeps me coming back. Right. That's why I continue to do it because I, I I I know it's there. I know I can do it on a course you've you know, played all the time, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And I think that I think that it it, it boils back down to you know in in golf, it's just get out there, play repeat mm-hmm. kind of like the dean crepe yep. you know write submit repeat write submit <laughs> right? repeat and that's all you got to do because not everyone's going to like the way i do it or not everyone's going to like the way i do it but i have to just keep on doing it because i'm going to get that 76 every once in a while that 72 but i'm also going to have the 81s yeah and i've just got to enjoy all of them that's right that's great yeah and then the last thing which and i'm saving this for last because you know it's it's the the, the cornerstone of our relationship it's the cornerstone of 52 q's and that is, you can really only get so good on your own. I mean, you can only, the best golfers in the world, somewhere along the line, they had a coach, they had a mentor, they had somebody who was where they wanted to be, or somebody who had an understanding of, of a subject that they could absorb and, and use for themselves. So finding a mentor finding a coach that was instrumental for you. I know as a, as a composer and production music composer specifically, but also I'm assuming as a golfer. Yeah, I I will say, uh, you know, I think, and we have talked about this before. One of the things that I think accelerates growth the quickest is finding a mentor and, and working underneath their tutelage. Now, when I was, when I, I, so I, I was growing up in the golf in the eighties and, you know, I had a I had a golf coach. His name was Jim Smitty Smith, and uh, just a fantastic. He was a, a disciple of Ben Hogan, and and so that's where I really built my, uh, built my foundation. And you know, Jack Nicholas had a coach, Jack Grout. You know, uh, uh, most of these golfers. But today, when you look at the at the top level golfers, they not only have a coach. But they have a team of individuals that is around them. They have a health nutritionist. They have a body coach. They have a short game coach. They have a a long swing coach. And all of this to say that keeping oneself at the highest levels of performance on there requires a whole team of individuals. And so my recommendation to anyone who's looking to really accelerate that is find yourself a mentor, whether that be Dave, whether that be the 52 Q's community, Mm -hmm. you know, any of these, any place that you you kind of gel with or, and is going to put you onto the right track that, that is so invaluable in golf and in production music or even in composition. You know, I, I, I can't stress enough the importance of having, um, a, a teacher, you know, and, and, it, when I, when I was a golf professional, thank goodness that that golf is such a hard game because it kept me employed a little bit. It helped <laughs> pay the bills, you know, for, to helping other people yeah. to try to achieve their goals. And um, but there's a satisfaction in seeing that gleam in someone's eyes when they hit it out there 75 yards and they got it in the air. Mm-hmm. And just getting a ball in the air is a dramatic achievement in golf. Yeah. Most people don't realize that, but it's a dramatic achievement. It's, in golf. it's one of those things that um, um, we see other folks do and it's like, hey, that, they make that look easy. When I see Tiger Woods swing in a club, it looks easy. It, yeah. looks, it looks easy, but I can, I can tell you from my very limited golf experience, it is not easy. And so when you see somebody either like me or, or, or Jesse or, or uh, you know, watch any of the Taxi TV episodes, first of all, you didn't see all the work that goes to, uh, kind of behind the scenes. But um, also, um, they make it look easy because of the reps and the time that they put into it. But right. even still, finding someone who can kind of come alongside you and guide you to where you want to be. I had a composition mentor, production music mentor that came alongside me. And um, I was wrong a lot, but they were eternally patient. And at the end of the day, they want the same thing, right? They they want me to be successful like I wanted me to be successful. And so it seems super cheesy <laughs> for a teacher to say like, your success is my success, but that's absolutely true. You know, we had some folks over the weekend get some air on college football. And I was as ecstatic for that placement as if it were my own, because their success is absolutely my success. 
absolutely. And I would say in golf, the default position is to have a coach. You don't see very many guys who don't have a coach. In fact, they, they don't telecast all the time. Oh, okay, well, he just changed his swing coach. And sometimes that happens, and, there, and there's nothing wrong with that. So perhaps you have one person that you started with, and then you have an, and then you, you kind of stagnated, and then you got to move on to someone else and these different kinds of things. So it's, it's really all about, you know – maintaining that forward growth. And it's not a, it's not an indictment of the previous individuals. What it is, is just, you know, you just have to, sometimes you need something fresh or something, you know, just a different perspective. And it's not an indictment on the skill. I mean, Tom Brady, (laughs) yeah, arguably the best quarterback ever to throw a football had a quarterback's coach. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, and and I'm like, if, if Tom Brady could, could get a coach, you know, I, I think I I can do with a composition mentor, uh, because you just having an outside perspective, somebody outside of your own head who can see things from a different angle that you just can't. You can't see what the back of what what, what your butt looks like when you swing a ball, even if you put a camera up, it's not the same, right? No. No. And so uh, finding somebody, finding a mentor, uh, whether, whether it's 52 Qs, whether it's me or whether it's somebody else, it doesn't matter. Just find somebody who you resonate with, who you trust. I think that's super important. Somebody that you trust, somebody that, you know, has achieved a level of success or d- uh, demonstrable skills that, that you respect and that you trust, and then just um, reach out to them. And that's why that's why I say that someone who has achieved a certain level of success. So, I mean, someone may be 85 or 90 years old and might not hit the ball like they once did, but you know, who wouldn't want to take a lesson from Jack Nicholas? Right. Who who doesn't play golf now because so they they I, I think if you find those people who have at one point, you know, achieved a high level of success, that's going to maximize the use of dollars. I mean, I took some lessons from a guy by the name of Bob May hmm. uh, here in Las Vegas and Bob May was a professional golfer who um uh, you know, uh, sparred against Tiger Woods at the, at a PGA championship. They went into extra holes for it. Wow. And so he has a track record of that. And I, I learned so much just being around that kind of thing. So, um, yeah. So, so, the, so, you know, like I said, we, we just came out of black Friday, maybe instead of buying that synth, maybe, you know, buy a coaching session I, again, not for me. Just, I mean, cool if you do, but that's not the point. The point is, is that mentoring and interactive real time feedback like you said, Shane, I, I firmly believe it is the fastest way to step up your game. Yeah. You got to practice because I never like teaching a lesson when they hadn't practiced the week before. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the reasons I, I stopped teaching drum set lessons. I, I got tired of yeah. having, you know, middle schoolers have the same lesson. And I, I eventually told their parents, I'm like, listen, I'd be happy to, to take your $40 every single week, but we are literally having the same lesson. And it no, just no, drained absolutely, me. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Very well, good. Well, Shane, once again, I cannot overstate how thankful I am for you and how much I appreciate everything that you've done in the community and for your time here today. And uh, it really is an honor and a privilege to uh, to play even a small role in your professional development as a composer. And um, and I really, really uh, thank you for your time today and all of your insight. The, being a professional golfer seems so outside of anything that I have any consciousness about that it's fascinating to see how much really carries over into what we do as production music composers. But Shane, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. Once again, a huge word of thanks to Shane for joining me today. You know, living here in Florida and like close to Disney and everything, there are a ton of really amazing golf courses down here. So Shane, if you ever come to Florida, maybe, maybe I'll join you on the links and, uh, and, and give, give golf the old college try one more time. But again, Shane, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and also a huge word of thanks to the family, friends, and neighbor subscribers of 52Qs who pay their actual real life money to make all of this possible. You know, you don't hear any embedded ads for meal plans or plugins or headphones or anything like that. And the reason we're able to do that here at 52Qs is because of support from people just like you. So in, in, in addition to all of those perks, they also get the satisfaction of knowing that they are helping their fellow composers. So if this sounds like something you're interested in, then uh, head over to 52Qs.com. Uh, we have family subscriptions, friend subscriptions, and neighbor subscriptions starting at around 
about four bucks a month. We would love to have you over there. But that is going to do it for me this week. You definitely want to join me next week where I am going to be asking, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? What are the fears that are standing in your way of becoming the next version of yourself? So we're gonna talk about fears, maybe some of the common fears that you might run up against in the creative industry, especially in production and library music. And uh, I'll share some of my strategies on overcoming our fears, but tune in next week for sure. Um, and again, I hope you've had an amazing week four, and I know that you are going to have an amazing week five. Why do I know that? Because I know, trust, and believe that the universe has amazing plans just for you. Until next time, peace. The 52 Cues podcast is copyright 2024, 818 Studios, all rights reserved. The music played on the podcast is copyright of their respective owners and is used with permission and for educational purposes only. For more information, including joining the community or becoming a member subscriber of 52Qs, head over to 52Qs.com.